That was kind of funny, kind of weird, actually. So, are we back? Yeah, I gotta sh- share it here. So oh, why don't okay. you just keep going? What are we gonna do? Oh, hang on. There we go. I uh, I'm not really sure what to say. I'm at a loss for words today, except that I am in a great mood because the world is beautiful and it's the last sun, fall days, and uh, it's been sunny out and. Uh, my life is pretty blessed, and I watched the debates last night, which were crazy and fun, and go Hillary. Sorry, I'm going to be political for a second. <laughs> okay, sorry right. guys. I don't know, you know, technology. Uh, doing the best we can here. So, okay, let's let's get to the topic. So last yes. week we talked a lot about raising uh, boys and people with penises, Um uh, without sexual shame. Um, as usual, when we post these events or post that we're going to have these events and also just generally for our wall, we uh, would really love for questions like what's up for you. So in the context of last week, we talked about the muzzle of shame. Yeah, I even made a meme with a cat with a muzzle over it. It was pretty funny. Yeah, so <laughs> I made one too. Did you see that? Yeah. <laughs> so um, that has been a little... Um, it, that has sort of blown my mind is and and has educated me a lot as a teacher right as a teacher we're constantly learning um i didn't realize how hard it was for people to talk about sex until i started trying to get these conversations going um and so i do believe that it is shame that makes it even hard for us to talk about it at all so anytime you bring any of your questions, know that we know that. Um, one of our discussion dialogues, whenever, or dis- discussion um, guidelines, whenever we get together, is expect to feel uncomfortable. Um, and uh, we think that that's the... Im- Hi, Shannon. We think that that's one of the uh, impacts of shame. So again, let's go back to that consent culture um, topic, which is if I can't talk about it because I've got the muzzle of shame on, how can I advocate for myself about it? Right? These are some of the things that are very close to my heart as a parent of two children, which actually gets to one of the questions that somebody yep. asked. Um, so one question on the event page was, uh, I don't have it in front of me, so I can't read it verbatim. But this person has a four and a half year old and they were asking about sexual agency, sexual yeah. agency. And they jumped to um, what if she ends up, I think it was a she, can't mm-hmm. remember. What if at 12 she wants to have sex? How do we prepare <laughs> ourselves for that? Ah, So um, I never. Where did it take you? Yeah, you... Where, where it took me. So. One of the, one of the things is 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 um, when we have conversations with our with 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 our children when they're young when we have those the conversations with our children when they're young when our children are um, um, first starting to to come to learn about boundaries and we have these conversations then when they're when they reach an age of ten twelve thirteen fourteen we can have um, they're already prepared to have the conversations as we get older and. My brain just totally lost what I was going to say. <laughs> what, what we talked about earlier. Okay, That's, but because I'm getting old, yeah, and I'm you also things. have so many good thoughts, you just can't keep track of them all. Right. Um, Give me a hint. What yeah, was I going to say? Well, no, no but I want to. <laughs> I want to speak to what you just said, which is a yeah. really important point. Let's amplify this one. Yes. Um, many sex educators uh, are saying it that I respect, which is that. We want our children to know that we are sex experts. So part of what I'm doing with my own children uh, throughout their lifetime is letting them know that I'm somebody who knows about sex and uh, just like anything else and that they can come to me and talk to me about it at any time at any time. Um, And then also that there are other people in my community that they can go to and talk to if it is something that they don't feel comfortable uh, talking to me about. So just like anything else as a parent, it's the same, it's the same back and forth as anything. Um, And that's how I want it to be. And I think it's the shame that actually makes that hard 
like hard for us to even imagine that that's how it could that's be. Right. right. I mean, how many people did we hear in our uh, raising kids without sexual shame conversations come and say, what have we heard? We've heard uh, no one ever talked to me about sex. Uh, people didn't even know that women, women didn't even know that they were going to start bleeding. People with uteruses didn't know yeah. they had them. Um, I never had a sex conversation when I was a kid. Um, when I was 11, I asked my stepmother where babies came from and she said, what do you think? And I told her and she goes, to her credit, she goes, you're, you're right. And the correct words are penis and vagina. And that was it. And that, that was my full thing. Yeah. At least, to her credit, she used the correct words. Right. Um, but I had no consciousness about it, which meant that uh, when the, I got older, I didn't have any way of advocating for myself. I didn't have sexual agency as a, mm -hmm. as a young teenager because... I had no consciousness about sexual agency. So yeah. when we give our children personal agency, take the word sex out of it, just personal agency at a young age, then they continue to have agency as, an, as they grow older. And they're also willing to come to you and go, um, I think I want to have sex. What am I going to do about it? And then you can have a conversation with them. And then hopefully at 12, they realize that they don't have to be pushed into it. Yeah, and so that's that, some you know, of where our conversation went. I mean, the, yeah. So. The topic of sexual agency in and of itself is such a huge topic. Like even right as she's talking, like uh, memories are going off in my head. I mean, part of being raised uh, essentially in a massage school and um, meditating and doing yoga and all the things that I did that helped develop my body awareness is that I did have a lot of body agency. And so... Um, having that agency was was in my tool belt when I started to navigate being a sexual human being um, with other people. You know what I mean? Like as I started, I wish I would have known more about misogyny. That would have been really useful, which gets yeah. into the microaggressions conversation that we had in our last episode. Episodes, should we call them episodes? Why not? <laughs> so, um, so, okay, let's let's pull this back. So we're talking about sexual agency and developing sexual agency with our children, which comes back, we're pulling that back to just agency in general. Um, you know, being a parent that um, involves them in their decision making and their conversations, and they can see that I'm somebody who's interested in, in their input in respects their choices. And yeah. Their, yeah. You know, um, so which story to tell? So I, going along with having personal agency, when I went to, so I had, there was a boy when I was 15 who was really trying to pressure me into having sex and I hadn't had intercourse at that point. And uh, my mom was at work and uh, she had a huge, she was at her desk and I walked in and I said, mom, um, I won't say his name, such and such is uh, really trying to get me to have sex with him. And she tells, you know, I've heard her version of the story, right? So she apparently panicked. I didn't know she panicked. <laughs> um, and she looked up at a picture that was sort of like um, a picture she could get solace in. And she turned to me and she said, you have a gift to give one person, which she was re referring to my virginity. Um, and you get to decide whether or not he's worthy of that gift. What a beautiful thing to say. And I said, yeah, no, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> See, and I couldn't even fathom having that right. conversation with my family. Right. Not even fathom it. If I would have, my father made me break up with a boyfriend who was a lot older than me, and I had not had sex with him, and hadn't was he actually didn't pressure me to have sex, because my father found out that he had been married before. And my father said, well, a man's only going to want one thing if he's been married before. Although he let me date a guy that was three years older than that guy in his late twenties, because he had never been married, and that guy pressured me all the time. So, you know, I would so, never have talked with that with my father about about sex. So retelling yeah. that story, you know, I'm thinking about some of my own confusion around this as I've grown up, which is that I think that ironically, I say ironically only because society sort of puts out there that adults shouldn't ever talk about their own sexuality with their children. But I think part of how I felt comfortable to go and talk to my mom about my sexuality was because I had had conversations with my mom. I mean, I remember when I first learned about first base, second base, third base, 
my mom and I had this whole conversation in the car. I can still remember. We're driving in the car, and I'm talking to her about the bases, and she's like, wow, the bases were different when I was a kid. <laughs> oh, interesting. You guys think oral sex comes before actual penis vagina sex? Interesting. We saw it the other way. So, I, you know, these were conversations that my mom and I just had. So it wasn't – I wouldn't think not to go to my mom to ask her – about this thing right. that I was struggling with, right? So that speaks to a number of things. Um, and then I, I guess I want to also share this this moment that I had. So, you know, I, I'm like, oh, it would be a good idea to raise kids without sexual shame. Da, 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 da. And Alina says, okay, let's go do this thing. And I'm like, oh, okay, let's go do this thing. And then all of a sudden I start to get to be known as this person who does this thing. So, you know... It's got social ramifications to a certain extent. For the most part, people treated <laughs> treated me well. But um, my daughter wanted to have a sleepover when she was seven, uh, birthday sleepover birthday party, and there were a couple of parents that didn't want their daughters to sleep over, and I didn't know why. And we had this conversation around it, and uh, one of the mothers that I respect. I have complete respect for, uh, started to explain to me that the reason that she didn't want her daughter to have a sleepover was because she was afraid that later in life they might have sleepovers that were um, had other genders at it, and they were afraid that that would then put their child in some sort of danger. And the severity and the seriousness of which this mother that I have so much respect for said this to me made me start questioning myself. And I remember walking away from this conversation going, holy shit, am I fucking up? Like, am I doing this wrong? <laughs> and it was one of those moments where, I'll be real blunt. Well, the way it went in my head is, okay, that's the convent model. I'm going to choose to go with the education empowerment model. I don't know where that's going to lead. And that is some of where the conversation Alita and I had earlier before we came on the call went. Which is, we don't know. Adults today, parents today, don't know what it is to raise children without sexual shame. Because sexual shame has been used to control sexuality for so that's long. Right. What we do know is that both of us in our experience and other people that we've talked to in their bulks of experience is that often when somebody has felt coerced or somebody has come out of a situation where they feel like they've been abused, we often find that part of the culprit, whether on probably both sides, is sexual shame. So I, we are saying, let's do this differently. And we don't know exactly where that's going to go. But what we do know is what damage has been done to the people who yeah. we've talked to and worked with who have been raised by having their sexuality controlled through shame. Does that make sense? I think it's a really important Can you like press point. a thing so we know that yes. that landed? Okay. <laughs> we see a thumbs up. Yeah. <laughs> but, and it's, it's, it's totally true. And so, so by keeping the conversation going, as I say, no change happens as I said before, without um, a conversation. By keeping the conversation going and having it be so that every single person who encounters us realizes that we're all dealing with it. I still, I'm 63 years old and I still at times go, take big breaths and deal with the shame that I got given to me when I was a young girl by my crazy, wonderful, insane, fabulous family that um, didn't know any better because they were products of their sexual shame and they were products of their sexual shame. We can stop it. And that's why we're doing this. It will, yeah. Yeah. And, and I've seen the results. I've watched a change in how people talk. And I know it's because of not just Nicole and I, but people like Nicole and I who are willing to get out there, talk about things that uh, were forbidden even 10 years ago. Five yeah. Years you even ago. talk about, yeah. Even talk about it all. That's right. So that's a lot of the courage that we're asking for any of you. Here you have an assignment. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to give them an assignment. <laughs> Yay. Okay. <laughs> um, a lot of people say they support us. 
a lot of people say they think we're doing great stuff and think it's really great. So um, I would love for everyone who says what we're doing is great and supports us to amplify it um, through whatever medium, whether it's you having the courage to take off a little bit of that muzzle of shame and, and ask a question that you've been scared to ask because putting it in words makes it real. Um, tell a story. You know, one of my favorite things to do on the Raising Kids Without Sexual Shame page is to share dialogues that parents have with yeah. children or adults have had with children about sex. Um, we don't see those enough. Um, and we're so afraid of doing it wrong that then when people do have the dialogues, they don't, it's like, should I talk about it? Even when we mess up. You know, like, look how, look how my shame just totally made me an idiot when I tried to answer this question. <laughs> like, we need to, I know that was a huge part of me accepting my own humanness around being a mother, was being able to be in community with other mothers and other parents who were saying, oh, your kid does that too? Oh, you don't know how to handle that either? So the more we can do that around this discussion, I think the I just think the more healthy it'll be, but obviously that's, right. that's I'm biased because I think this is a good idea. You might not. <laughs> and and for those of you who have young children, the more you are are speaking to not necessarily your kids right now, if that's still uncomfortable, but talking to others, posting on our website, on our our page, um, it gives you that that next step to have that conversation with your kids. To be able to sit down when they come up to you and go, Mommy, where 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 do babies come from? And have a real conversation instead of a, well, what do you think? And yeah, you're right. And walk away because you're afraid to talk to them about it. Uh, or making up some wonderful wild story about yeah. storks and all that weird stuff. So <laughs> A pamphlet. Someone said that they never got had a talk. Someone just put a pamphlet under their... Well, a parent just put a pamphlet under their door. I know somebody put books out all over it. But it, it's a story. One of the things that... A friend of mine did, a couple of friends of mine have, have done over the years, is that because of their discomfort, um, I have, I, the godmother to several kids, is that I was the person they could come and talk to. So if, if you have that kind of discomfort, but there is somebody else that they can have a conversation with um, that you can trust... I was the, I had an agreement with my best friend that I would her kids could talk to me about anything, and most of the time it was about sex, and um, I would never tell her what we talked about unless they gave me permission, and you know what? It helped her kids move forward, and she has two of the most amazing children that uh, are so self aware and so self conscious because we worked together to give her kids that they were like my own children for many years, but. Because she still was not comfortable enough to talk about it at sure. that time. Now she's like, whatever. You know, which actually takes me to the other question that we, we got asked. And I don't know if this is the case for the person that you're talking about. But um, somebody asked about um, when you yourself have been sexually abused as a child and then you become a parent. I mean, that's a huge topic. It is. It is. Um, we, know, we know the numbers are way too high. So there's a good chance that a lot of parents who are raising their children have been violated in some way sexually. That's right. And and what happens is that it, it's a lot harder to start a conversation when you're still dealing with that pain. And, and plus, that's sometimes that's all we know. If that is all we know... Um, I've been, I was fortunate. I was not sexually abused, but I was physically abused as a child. Uh, my father and my stepmother were both, um, pretty handy with the, the belt and the smack and the, and, and that's all I knew as far as how to raise a child. You raised a child with hitting them. And I was conscious enough growing up that I said, I will never do that. And then the first time my, um, at that time, maybe 10 year old stepson made me really, really angry. I caught myself ready to strike him. I didn't, but I raised my hand back and I was going to hit him because that's all I knew. And I was mortified because sometimes that's all we know. And uh, being conscious of that at least makes is the first step towards being able to step set it aside. We do not have to be at the effect of our past. We do not have to be at the effect of our past. I'm going to repeat that because I think that's really an important thing. Because we like to say, well, I'm this way because of all this horrible shit that happened to me in the past. Yeah, you are, and you don't have to be effect of it. So what yeah. I hear you talking about it, your story is similar to my mother's story. My mom was hit. She said the way she put it to me is she was black and blue every day of her childhood, and she never raised a hand to me. 
And um, so what I know in that progression is a lot of what we are trying to do here. So let's say, you know, people have only had their sexuality controlled through shame as opposed to fostered and educated and, and developed and matured. Um, so it would be natural for us to then jump to that, right? If we've always been shamed about sexuality and we're terrified of it because that was the message that we were given, um, is that it's terrifying, so terrifying that I have to shame you about even having it. And we've said, no, that that's not right. We don't think we should do it that way. We're going to have to break this cycle. We do not have to be the effect of our past. We that's have right. to break that cycle. Now, I've said this to you. I said this to you last time I brought it up, and I'm going to say it again, is that is a lot of work. Yes. So it's one thing for a teacher or a coach or some or a friend to say, well, you just shouldn't do that. <laughs> and it's another thing to actually go in. The fact that there's even awareness that this is something that we shouldn't perpetuate is a big, big step. The fact that there's awareness that violence even occurred, right? I mean, trauma and denial are, are good friends. So if we've been traumatized, sometimes we don't even know we've been traumatized because we put it back in the recesses of our mind. Yeah. So, I mean, this is part of why holistic peer counseling is a pivotal piece of the work that I do. Uh, we're not going to solve how do I become a parent who comfortably uh, talks with my children about sexuality um, when I have been abused sexually we're not going to solve that in a, in a talk um, I'm well aware of that and so I've created a curriculum to bring people's awareness to their sexuality you've created entire world world <laughs> yeah of places for people adults to go and uh, play you guys call it play play yeah. to learn about and embrace your own sexuality. What I can tell you is there is a lot of healing that can take place when we know we want to do better than what was done to us. Um, and the tools exist and then we have to pick those tools up. Right. We have to be willing to do the work. Yeah. yeah. And it will yeah. be uncomfortable. It will be uncomfortable. Yep. But just even being here and having this conversation, we're hoping is already medicine um, to help all of us do it without perpetuating the domination and the abuse, violence. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're getting close. Okay. Like what? I can't see it. 11.29. Okay, so let's. We've got like five more minutes because we started late. So, um, hi everybody who's here who um, is actually watching live. Do any of you have anything to say or questions? We we like dialogue. <laughs> yes. We're we don't we're not pontificators. <laughs> yeah. If no one's going to say anything, you know, I'm going to think back to that mom who was worried about their child at twelve wanting to have sex. Um, and I and taking that to the conversation we just had about healing, I hear fear in there. Hi, Arwen. Arwen, Arwen. Um, I hear fear in there. Um, so I think for myself personally, I would start to look at my fears around that. One of my favorite things that was ever said in any of our uh, Raising Kids Without Sexual Shame discussions was the mom that came in and said, I think there's an elephant in this living room. And I said, and of course we're like, what? And she said, we're all talking like we never want our children to ever make any sexual mistakes. I and I've learned, yeah. I've learned some of my best lessons by making those mistakes. That's right. And again, the maturity and being able to notice the difference between a sexual mistake and being abused, it, right? Like that's a tricky little space there. When somebody, when two people have sex and come out of it and they don't feel well, what's the difference between, I mean, you've gone off about this. What's the difference between a mistake and actual problematic behavior? If we can't talk about sex... How are we going to even figure that out? That's right. Right? So we have to talk about it more. Hi, Brooke. 
And that means having these conversations. And, you know, four and a half is a great time to have a conversation about um, sex in a way that's not like, you don't have to like get out the diagrams, but you might want to. There's some really great books out there for kids that you can share and talk with them. Um, and the more, and it isn't just about having conversations with your kids about sex. It's having conversations with your children, period. And the more we have these conversations, the more that they know they can come to you and talk to you about anything that is happening in their lives, the more likely that they're going to have good personal agency as they become adults and young adults and teenagers, whatever. And that means that, that the worries are going to be a lot less. We're always going to worry about our kids, of course, and give them the agency yeah. to... to take care of themselves yeah. and to make those mistakes and education. Right. So, uh, um, if my child, I mean, what did I say to you? Uh, one of my kids said to me, they want to have their own YouTube channel when they're right. 13. And so actually <laughs> I just started with, so part of my job as your mom is to try and assess if you really understand the ramifications of the things you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> literally where I started and she said I do mom <laughs> <laughs> and so we started there and I was like well we've got three years till you're 13 so we'll just keep talking about it you know and then on the flip side I was like are you using your iPod to make your own videos and learn how to make videos and you know like one of the thoughts I was having as you were talking Alina is that I want my children to know that I'm an ally for them in their life um, which is different than me trying to live their lives. And giving children agency doesn't mean not having boundaries and not teaching. Not having boundaries, boundaries or not having input or, or not or not being like at times sometimes part of being a parent says means saying no. I don't think that's a good idea. That, you know. Yeah. Uh I have a friend who has a one year old who's not quite walking but knows how to climb up on the kitchen counter, you know. She's finding ways for him to climb onto things that's not the kitchen counter. So she doesn't have to worry about him falling off the kitchen counter. You know, those are kind of things that you do with your kids. You give them boundaries. You give them ways of expressing themselves that are healthy and safe and help them find, figure out for themselves, you know, yeah, I'm going to fall off the kitchen counter. It's going to hurt. So you, you work with your children at, depending on their age limits and that kind of thing. Yep. Yep. And yep. It's a bit of an experiment. We just think the other way didn't work. So we're trying to do it a different way. That's right. So uh, we're getting to the end of our time today. We will hopefully do another one of these in a couple of weeks. Um, mm. You can register at Nicole, N-E-K-O-L-E dot com. And you will get links when we do these. I put them on that YouTube page. Uh, Alina and I will be at the Bellingham Sex Positive Center on October 8th to facilitate a conscious relationship and what is sex. Yay. Um, Conscious yeah. relationships, my favorite. I love that one. And well, I like what's sex, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I taught it uh, increasing intimacy last weekend. That's my thing. So come and join us in Bellingham if you're up north. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's it. Have a great day. Ta-ta for now. Bye. Bye.